welcome to the Texas Art Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The current topic uh, that we are going to discuss today is current status of tavern. I'm Zvonimir Krasia. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Join us today is Dr. Vino Turani. He's a Marcus Chair of uh, Cardiovascular Surgery and Director or Marcus Valve of Piedmont Heart Institute. He also has multiple uh, positions and accolades, as you can see. He's the president of Southern Surgical uh, Association and the president of Heart Valve Society, as well as the president of South Atlantic Cardiovascular Society and co-chair of SDS ACC National Transcarter Valve Therapy uh, Database, in addition to uh, being uh, co-principal investigators on many TAVRA clinical trials. It's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Durani. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Here are our disclosures. I have uh, no conflict of interest pertinent to this presentation. And Dr. Tarani states that he has no conflict of interest pertinent to this presentation. So uh, Dr. Tarani, uh, we recently saw this publication of the SDS ACC TVT registry of transcatheriotic valve replacement and the trends in the United States with TAVR from 2011 to 2020. And you are one of the uh, uh, well, participants in this particular study, but also you have tremendous experience from uh, other studies as well, which is the base of this information. Can you uh, share with us a little bit uh, about this particular study? What are the new developments? Uh, and let's start with, uh, uh, sites, how many sites were performing TAVR that were included in this study, and also a little bit about TAVR volumes. Great. First of all, thank you uh, to you and the Texas Heart Institute for the invitation to, to be with you this, this, uh, for this session. And this is some of the latest uh, data. It's uh, not only part of the, the manuscript that we published uh, with John Carroll in 2020, but also some additional data that's unpublished. And I'll, I'll go through those over the time period. You can see this slide really talks about the geographic distribution. The next slide will talk a little bit more about the volume, but you can see, for instance, in Texas, you see an epicenter in certain areas of Texas. And for those of you watching this, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, sites in California. There are a lot of sites in Florida, a lot of sites in Texas, and then in the Northeast corridor uh, around New York and Boston. And so this just gives you a geographic distribution with a paucity in the, in the middle portion of the country um, that is a west of the Mississippi. And you can see that there's a lot less sites, but this just gives you a glimpse of where, where the sites are. And on the next slide, what you're able to see um, is that there, uh, the right-hand side, you can see there now, year to date uh, for 2020, this was the first quarter of 2020, there were 701 sites doing TAVR in the United States. And you can see that the volume has gone up through in 2019, there were 73 isolated <laughs> TAVRs performed, and you can see there was 4,492 valve and valve procedures performed. So we're just knocking on 78,000 uh, <clears throat> cases. You can see Q1 2020, they were already in Q1, there were 15,000, but remember COVID came into play. So I'm not sure that we'll hit um, that number that we thought we would, that growth that we would see with the low risk patients. It'll be interesting to see uh, Zinevir, whether we're going to hit that number because of COVID, but you can see the trends are pretty impressive uh, since 2012, since we've uh, started the registry. So can you uh, mention a little bit about what has happened to the outcomes as far as TAVR is concerned over the last decade or so, and uh, particularly considering on the overall mortality and mortality with different risk groups? Absolutely. So this just shows you the one-year mortality. So let's go through this a little bit. The blue line represents in-hospital mortality. The red line represents 30-day mortality. And the green line is the CMS-linked one-year mortality. So we're, uh, we're a little behind on the one-year CMS because it takes a while to get that data. So if we just concentrate on the one in uh, the, the uh, in-hospital 30-day mortality, you can see that 
our original, when we had extreme risk patients in 2012, you can see the mortality was, was up to almost 8% in 30 days. And you can see how over time that has really dropped um, over, uh, over this six, uh, seven year time period to 2.3%. This is all patients. It includes low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, extreme risk. So it's a different patient population, but you can see overall, you can see that it's about 2.3% in 30 days. If I go to the first quarter of 2020, you can see that we're down to 1.1%. Now, I think that the next slide will really show you what we're talking about within the risk groups. It's very different. I think that just the previous slide showed you just generic numbers. I think it's not fair anymore to look at that. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Zinevere, that you have to break it down into risk categories? Absolutely. So if you, look, if you look at 2019, all patients had that 1.3 and that 2.3, what we, what we talked about, but look at the differences. Low risk patients had a under 1% 30 day mortality. The high and extreme risk prohibitive patients had a 3.7. So really when I start to think about this, I think this slide is more important to me than is the previous slide, uh, which is talking about today. And I can confidently tell my patients uh, that are getting low risk, pay, uh, low, risk tower, low risk towers that they'll have a less than a one percent chance of mortality um, at 30 days. What are your thoughts? Do you agree that this is kind of what you're seeing in your populations? Oh, absolutely. I I think this is this is absolutely remarkable, particularly when we start uh, reviewing the data from the early experiences. And you were co-principal investigator of the partner trials, yeah. and you remember the the problems and issues related to mortality and also to morbidity. So yeah, I and also tremendous progress. Yeah, I think that another progress that we, we'll talk a little bit about in the future is that you know, I was doing 45, and when I did my first tavern in 2006, we were doing 45% of our patients were transapical. Remember, we've gotten away from that. And we'll talk a little bit, you and I will talk about that a little bit in a minute. So one, one interesting thing is, and maybe this is appropriate time to mention this, but it's related more to the future. We can see that we uh, can reduce the mortality, hospital and 30-day mortality dramatically in patients that are so-called low risk and intermediate risk. So it would it be prudent therefore to be a little bit more aggressive in treating those patients earlier rather than waiting until they get to a critical condition and then uh, you have serious aspects as far as mortality and morbidity is concerned. No, I think you're right. And, and, and you're talking about sometimes asymptomatic patients, but right. also that those patients that have maybe moderate, you know, those patients that have worse and moderate, but quite not severe. And I right. think those are ongoing studies that are going on. There's an asymptomatic uh, trial called the early TAVR study that's currently enrolling patients. And there's a, a, a couple of uh, companies are working on a moderate AS trial also, moderate AS and normal EF, not the moderate AS and low EF. I'm talking about the moderate as right. normally yet that there's contemplation of of starting those trials so i think that over the next couple of years we're really going to dive into that but i think in the low risk patients we still need to look at long term outcomes i think 30 day mortality is probably not adequate for a for a 65 year old i think we expect those patients to live over 15 years so i think we still have a lot to figure out over the next 5 years very good so uh one uh, very important uh, issue is a median length of stay so what has happened in median length of stay? And uh, this is a very pertinent question because I actually uh, was at your institution to uh, learn how to do a fast track TAVR. Um, it means uh, just a 24 hour stay. So you, you have tremendous experience in it. And one of the earliest publications in the yeah. United States related to uh, this particular approach. Yeah, I mean, you know, resource utilization, I think, uh, for the physicality of an institution has become more and more important. And we did adopt that early on um, in the minimalist pathways that I did when I was, you know, uh, in my prior institution at Emory. Um, and you can see the length of stays at 2014. You're looking at, again, high risk patients in green, red or intermediate risk patients in low are, um, are, are, um, uh, are low risk patients are in the uh, blue. You can see now over time, we've gone from four to five to six days, all the way down to one to two days. So I think that for the most part, most of these patients now, you would expect them to have a median length of stay after the procedure of, of less than two days. I think this becomes important, but 
what we need to dissect out a little bit more clearly is we have a step up from in-hospital mortality to 30-day mortality. I would rather a patient stay an extra day, but decrease that gap of in-hospital to 30-day mortality. So I think we need to be cautious and not pushing patients out too fast. To, to, and we need to, in our own institutions, need to figure out how to close that gap of in-hospital in 30 day, even if it means that we that keep the patient for one other day. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think for low risk patients, it's pretty uh, straightforward that they right. can be discharged within 24 hours in great majority of instances. That's what we do practically yeah. routinely. It also depends on a patient's underlying condition, which right. uh, plays a significant role as well. And uh, many, many other factors, but uh, I absolutely agree with you. We should not be discharging the patient just for the sake that we wanted to uh, reduce the cost that uh, we have to think of the patient's benefit first. Yeah, and, it, have, and uh, it becomes more costly if they get readmitted, quite honestly. Right, that, that is absolutely yeah. true. But uh, just one more comment relating to this uh, shorter length of stay, which is like you say, minimalist approach that you popularized and also what we call a fast track uh, uh, <clears throat> protocol for TAVR, which is not a topic of this presentation, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it, it's, it's doable for a lot of institutions and for a lot of operators, but you have to pass a certain learning curve. Yep. You have to know how to do it uh, to avoid serious problems. Uh, you're right. I, I had done over 400 or 500 TAVRs before we started. I don't think we need to do that now anymore but you probably need to have 40 or 50 under your belt so that you feel comfortable understanding where the, the um, snakes are underneath the rocks. All right, let's move forward. So uh, another thing is that we would like to know what has happened with the trends uh, uh, as far as uh, the age is concerned and tablet procedures over a period of time. Yeah, this is great. So what, we've, uh, what I've elected to do is break it down you know, into the different uh, categories. I think that's important as we dissect these patients out. It's interesting to me, the intermediate risk and the high risk patients at the top haven't really changed in the last two or three years. They're still hovering around 80 to 81 as a median age. Look at what the low risk patients, you're, now, you see some low risk patients in 2014, um, but that's all because what the team, the heart team designated that patient to be. But you see that we're down to 75. My prediction is that we'll be down to a median age of 70 by the end of 2020. Mm. So I think that, that this will continue to decrease. I think the high risk patients and intermediate risk patients will probably stay in the uh, low 80s to upper 70s. Interesting. And what this is the heart reason for the procedure? What has happened? Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to look at this, right? There's one, which is the SDS score. And then one is what the heart team designated that patient to be. And the SDS scores sometimes don't match with what the heart team says. For, for instance, there may be a patient with a porcelain aorta that has a very low SDS score, but is considered an extreme risk patient. So to me, this is a very a better way to look at it, is what did the heart team decide? Look at the growth uh, of low risk patients in blue. It is now 26% of the TAVRs in 2020 of Q1. That blows me away. It's a faster increase than I had anticipated. Look at 2019, 12%. So if, 20, if the rest of 2020 holds into place, I would guess that you're going to have low and intermediate risk will be the dominant players uh, for uh, the reason for having a TAVR. And I think that we'll continue to see extreme risk and high risk, but the growth will be in low risk patients. Yeah, I agree with you. Nothing can replace the human factor and physicians experiencing experience in making the judgment who's at low risk who's intermediate risk and who is at extreme or high risk yeah that's great and i do want to show you what the sts scores look like so look at the high risk in green it's about the same it hasn't dropped as fast as i thought it would you can see that in 2014 we had 6.7 percent as the median sts score is now at six percent if you look at intermediate risk it has dropped from 5.3 to 4 and already we're seeing low risk patients go from 3.1 to 2.3. But really, if you look at the, uh, from 2019 to 2020, it's really 2.3 and 2.3. So roughly we're seeing most of these patients, I think will be around the one to 2% range for low risk patients. Very good. And here, uh, this is from uh, the Jack article. You can see that the majority of these patients 
are going home now. Look at the difference in 2011 to 2013, uh, you know, only, um, Two thirds of the patients were really going home, but now over 90%. This just shows you the reflection of moving from extreme risk prohibitive patients to lower risk patients, in my opinion. All right. Another thing is that uh, maybe it's not well represented here, but it's certainly true in your experience, in my experience, using the minimalist approach, yeah. local anesthesia and conscious sedation, percutaneous approach offers us the benefit to discharge patients sooner. No doubt about it. Have less complications, whether it's vascular or cardiac or whatever else. What we noticed that uh, we actually, uh, early on, one of the things that drove us to do this is that when you have octogenarians who are intubated, they almost, most of them, greater than two thirds of them had some type of swallowing issues and they had silent aspiration. And you don't get that if you don't intubate the patient. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about some issues that have been a major problem in the past, particularly as far as access site preferences are concerned and reasons for those complications and what has happened in the last decade or so and how has this affected the outcomes? So I think this is probably the number one reason that our outcomes have improved. Um, you can see that uh, a third of the patient, 30% of the patients uh, all, all, you know, we're, we're trans uh, apical at that time in 2014. We only had trans aortic or trans apical. Subclavian was not that popular at that time. Look at, and you've seen our curves for mortality. They're absolutely inversely related to this. Look at the growth that in right now in the United States, 96% of patients have a trans femoral arterial access. And that I think is a large portion of why A, patients are going home at one to two days afterwards. Um, B, they're going home instead of going to a nursing uh, facility. And three, I think our survival is better because of that. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is a very important reason of the uh, improvement in the outcomes for transcatheter valve therapies. I'm sure you would agree with that, uh, Zenevir. Absolutely. Actually, uh, in the early uh, uh, trials, uh, partner trials, the incidence of vascular complications was close to 16%. Yeah. And we have dropped down tremendously to uh, definitely below 5%. 5%, below yeah. That. yeah. So I, uh, I think that has been huge. And, and think about how that's happened over uh, a decade. And to me, that's absolutely remarkable that uh, the companies have been able to do that within, within a decade. And definitely uh, the closure devices have helped us a great deal yeah. as well. 100% agree. And so I did, we did want to just tell you what are the different pathways for alternative access. So you can see transapical has uh, significantly decreased. I, I've done over 300 transapical valves, TAVR valves, and, and that was my mainstay. But as you can see in the United States in 2019, only 200 were done in the entire United States. So a major decrease. Direct aortic similarly has gone way down. Axillary becomes the dominant so far. But the fastest rising is the transcarotid um, that uh, we are able to publish the first paper in North America in doing that case um, uh, when the valves were first available in 2014. So I've now done over almost 75 transcarotids. Um, that's my second choice, but you can see the country across the board is doing more axillary subclavian. Um, and I think these are, these are interesting. Other, other includes transcables. So uh, Transcable is also uh, an alternative access uh, that is uh, that is being used, but not in huge amounts, as you can see here. You know, interestingly, uh, I, I was a little bit surprised to hear that uh, your second approach is uh, transcarotid. Uh, we do a significant number of uh, tavers, and uh, I personally have uh, not had any scenarios where I felt like have I have no other option but transcarotid. Yeah. Part of the reason for it is, uh, number one, uh, we feel pretty comfortable with femoral assets and percutaneous closure devices. That's number one. I've been doing that for several decades. Right. For EVAR, TVAR, and so on. But also uh, now with the advent of uh, shockwave. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Right vessels, we can treat those and gain access through the femoral artery. So I have not had a need really to uh, 
use a carotid access. Occasionally we'll do a subclavian, but most of the time we are successful with a transfemoral and transcaval. Yes, it's reasonable in certain scenarios, but uh, the technology is not there yeah. to remedy the access sites. And then it adds a cost tremendously, no doubt. Yeah, no, it adds, it adds cost. So our pathway is transfer arterial. Number two is shockwave, to your point. Uh, but right. you know, remember, that was only available uh, only uh, for the last year or so. Before that, we didn't have access very much to that. Right. Our third choice is transcable. Our fourth choice is transcarotid. So when I mean it's our, our second choice, it's after shockwave, after transcable, then it's transcarotid. So people have to have gone through four uh, rejections before they get to transcarotid. And another reason that this is less and less needed, alternate access, is because the profile of the devices have decreased. To yeah, and I expect them to get better, don't you? Right, absolutely. So uh, there is less and less need for alternate access. Yeah, from I agree. I 100% agree. Okay, so let's, let's talk about differences as far as the growth is concerned between TAVR and Saber, you are a cardiothoracic surgeon. So you started with Saber first, and now you're embracing more and more Taver. Yeah. But what is happening? What are the trends? Yeah, so I think you're right. You know, this week for me, it's a mix of both, right? I did five Tavers today. I did, uh, I, I've done three aortic valves since Wednesday, right? So in two days, it's been a total of eight of ways of eight valve patients, aortic valve patients, three have been open, five have been transcatheter. So I've embraced both of those equally. But what we'll see in the country is uh, the black line represents TAVR. You can see the ex exponential growth of it. Number one represents uh, the intermediate risk patients. Number two represents the low risk patients. So you can see the escalations in uh, late 25 and then the escalations in 2019 from those two uh, components. And the very top line, which is all SAVR, that includes ABR cabbage, ABR mitral valve, Bentall procedures, root replacements. Um, as you can see, that's now for the first time is starting to decrease uh, from 64,000 to 57,000. The blue line is isolated SAVR only. And you can see that line is slowly decreasing, uh, I think since 2016. Um, so, you know, overall now there are more towers implanted than all surgical valves. Uh, but, oh, but, but you must also acknowledge that we are now treating more patients with aortic stenosis as a whole. So right. if you look at 2012, the number of we are patients we were treating was only about 66,000. Now you look at it and it's over 130, 140,000. So the overall number of patients we're helping is, is more. And I think Taver is leading the charge with helping those patients. Very interesting. <clears throat> now, one of the hottest uh, issues in Ireland uh, is valve and valve procedures. And uh, what is your personal point of view? And then what did the literature show as far as the trends are concerned? Yeah. So of course, we're only going to talk about TBT tonight. For this session, we're only talking about TBT, so we're showing trends. You know, we, we do a lot of valve and valves. Now, lately, quite honestly, we've been doing some TAVR in TAVRs. That's a whole new uh, ball wax. This doesn't really include that part of it. This is more of uh, TAVR and SAVR. Um, I think that, you know, these are something that we're seeing more and more of. Uh, I get very upset when I see 19 valves and 21 valves from surgeons because they've become a bigger problem for you and I when we do a valve and valve taver because the gradients remain high. Um, and so that becomes a problem. But look at this. You're starting to finally see an increase. This is uh, the, the, the orange, uh, the red lines are the actual uh, elective planned taver and saver. Um, and so this is, you know, escalating from 1,300 patients to 4,500 patients. I think this will increase more and more because more and more surgeons are putting in tissue valves. The number of mechanical valve implantations has gone down dramatically in the United States over the last decade. You can see immediately and during TAVR, that's a complication. That's an intraprocedural complication that is going down. And so the need for a uh, implantation of, let's say, one uh, valve, and then right away you had a perivalve leak or you had embolization and you have a second valve, that complication is going down, but the overall elective cases for TAVR and SAVR are going up. It, it's nice to see this, but I don't think we've cracked this nut yet. I think there's a lot of issues with gradients and thrombus that we still have to work on for this patient population. Now <laughs> we need to discuss a little bit of uh, the issues that are still persisting or 
the unmet needs as far as uh, diver is concerned and uh, what, what uh, is coming in the future or what are we doing at the present time to overcome those unmet needs? Yeah, I think that stroke has always been there for us. Um, and uh, I, I would say that the best data is the 30 day data in the uh, in hospital data. The CMS link data is not, in, not a complete data set because it's in uh, older patients. But you know, we have not made a significant dent. We've gone from 2.8 to 2.4. Remember I showed you the mortality slides that had a steep decline in mortality over this time period. We've seen decline in the length of stay, decline in the age, everything. We haven't seen a huge decrease. We're still seeing a 2%, uh, uh, north, just north of 2% stroke rate. Even when cerebral protection was added in 2018, we're still seeing a 2.4. Let's see what happens with 2020. We did see a small decrease as you see in the in-hospital because I have that data for 2020 Q1. It went from 1.6 to 1.4. So this is adjudicated through the TBT, uh, through DCRI. So this is an important, this is, uh, this is the one of the endpoints that we do adjudicate through the TBT database. So I think the data is good. I think that we need to find better ways to decrease the stroke rate. So how does this compare with the cyber? So the, the, it depends. So it, well, we, we, I actually published a paper on annals of thoracic surgery. It depends dramatically on the risk of patients. And I think that we need to dissect this out in the risk categories of patients. In low risk patients, the stroke rate was very low, um, similar to this, but in high risk patients, it was higher. So it'll be interesting. I think that overall, what we originally saw from partner one, we had a much higher stroke rate in TAVR, I think that right now we're probably seeing a lower stroke rate in TAVR than we are in surgery. Yeah, so uh, there is a, an issue whether cerebral protection devices significantly improve uh, or reduce the risk uh, of uh, embolic events. And uh, what we have seen here is there, there's no dramatic drop. And this is understandable because any manipulation with catheters or wires across the aortic arch that has a lot of atheromatous changes can contribute, including placement of the cerebral protection devices. Right. When you use a transcranial Doppler and you start at the very beginning, you can see that any manipulation of any devices contributes to those hits or micro, micro emboli. Now you're but in our right. experience, the, the positive thing, even though with issues that we still have to deal with is that those uh, strokes are really minor. There are cognitive changes to a certain degree or minimal changes and very, very few patients need a major rehabilitation. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, I 100% I agree with you. I think that the, 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 the amount of stroke burden is less with transcatheter valve than it is with surgery. I do believe that. You know, commonly with the surgery ones, we, it's a large particulate matter. Um, that I think is um, causes a very uh, heavier debilitating disease process. You're right. So pacemaker rate uh, originally was about the nine to ten percent range. Uh, when we introduced self-expanding into the market, uh, there was an increase in pacemaker rate. It has come down uh, to about seven point eight to ten point six percent. I think this is somewhere um, that we need to be better at. I think eleven percent rate maybe in a high risk patient is okay. Um, and uh, maybe not so good in a low risk patient. And these are across the board higher than surgery um, when we look at these patients. So I think this is something that we're either gonna be setting ourselves up with a lot of tricuspid regurgitation down the road, but I think that we need to get better, the devices need to get better to decrease the amount of pacemaker rate. I'm not okay with 11% low risk pacemaker rate personally. Right, uh, well, we have seen now numerous publications from different centers talking about uh, special techniques, uh, so-called cusp over lap technique to That's reduce right. the pacemaker rate all the way down to somewhere in the range of no more than three to 5%. Yeah, and that's what I have. Last year, I looked at my data for 2020, and our, uh, our data at Piedmont Heart Institute, and ours was less than 5%. Um, and so I right. think it does, it does make a difference. Okay, so let's uh, mention about some uh, newer technologies and techniques uh, that are available or that uh, are on horizon. And we already did discuss a little bit about 
uh, cerebral protection devices. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what are the uh, people ask me is what what percent of your of the devices in the United States are using Sentinel? So, and when they was introduced in 2018, seven percent, right? Right. It went up to 11 percent in 2019. In 2020, we're sitting at in the United States, 13 percent of all towers done are using the Sentinel device. So everybody, you know, I do them in valve and valves. I do them in bicuspids. I do them in certain scenarios. Those with previous strokes, those with heavy calcium burden, but not at every patient. And that's probably represented. This is probably, we do about 15% of our patients are, have a, a central device. And that's what the country is showing right now from our database. Mm -hmm. And there are some other devices on the horizon that might be even that's right. better. That's right. That will cover all major uh, cranial vessels and hopefully that will right. offer Including you. the vertebrals and everything. Right. Yeah, so this is just gives you uh, uh, an overall look at the adjunct technologies that are being captured in the TBT registry. One is a Sentinel device, which is prevention of embolic strokes. As you can see, the total number uh, from 2018 to 2019 were over 11,000 uh, uh, native TAVR patients and 960 of the valve and valves. There's fracturing of the surgical valve rings, which is reduction of post-prosthetic uh, PPM, the pro uh, patient prosthesis mismatch and valve. You can see there were over 300 of those put in. And there's the basilica procedure, the prevention of coronary obstruction post a TAVR, so in a valve and valve case or others. And you can see here that we're starting to just getting close to maybe 200 patients for these. So we're starting to increase overall these unique uh, uh, techniques that are being done in the country. And since no one site is doing too many, this will, the TBT database allows us to aggregate those in a much larger uh, population. Very good. So, uh... Let's summarize, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. all the achievements that have been made in the last uh, decade uh, uh, for treatment of patients with aortic stenosis and using TAVR approach. Well, I'll summarize in the TBT, and I'm honored that the STS and ACC have, have uh, allowed me to be a, a, on the executives uh, for the registry. And what we've learned a lot from this, from the United States database, is that the procedure is now approved for high intermediate and low risk symptomatic patients. Mortality over the last five years, six years has significantly lowered. And I'm very happy and glad to see that. Vascular complications have significantly improved over this time period. The length of stay has been rapidly improving um, such that most patients are going home at one to two days. Femoral access has gone from in the 60 to 70% to all 96% now. And I, and I think that's been a huge uh, reason for the improvement in all of our outcomes. I think that the post-operative pacemaker implantation and also the stroke rates have decreased, but at moderate rates. And I think that's still what we, you and I and others need to really work on to provide better care for those for our patients in that regard. And I think that, well, and I mentioned this earlier, for us to really adopt this in all low-risk patients, we need a longer follow-up. And that's something that we're working on, not only the TBT database, but also in the randomized trials. So it looks like the future is bright as far as TAVR is concerned. Absolutely. And maybe uh, one, the last comment that I wanted to ask you to give us is uh, what you see in the future as far as improvements in TAVR are concerned. Uh, what are the potentials? What's coming as the new uh, technology and uh, what will make uh, TAVR even better. Yeah, I think that, you know, we'll start, we've been working with alloys that are a little bit uh, antiquated, nitinol and also uh, chromium cobalt. I think that we'll start to see a development of a more, um, a better alloys that will allow us to get down to maybe 10 French instead of 14 and 16 French. And that'll give us a lot more capability of doing procedures. I think we'll streamline them so that we can better predict uh, by computer simulations, we can decide this valve is better for this valve. Uh, for this uh, patient scenario. I think computer simulations, uh, I know we're working with some guys at Georgia Tech on this, that's gonna, I think, improve which valve is the best, which valve has the least amount of thrombosis, which has the best amount of coronary access. So I think that computer simulation is gonna become important. I think that having a technology uh, that allows us to have better febrile access to 99.9% .9 and allows us to get to 10 or 12 French sheets will become really important adjuncts to improve uh, uh, this procedure. And of course, that will somehow we'll need to work on computer simulations also for pacemaker implantation, 
where to put it, where not to put it, and decreasing stroke rate. So I think we have major areas of improvement. And I think the next five years is going to be an absolutely exciting time for patients to have this new technology. Very good. We know uh, I greatly appreciate your participation and to give us the opportunity to join this Texas Heart Institute educational programs. Uh, I think uh, you are one of the shining stars as far as Taver is concerned and promoter of this technology. And uh, we are all indebted to you and appreciate uh, all of the achievements that you have made in this field. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. I'm very honored that you asked uh, for me to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you.